This is the first of a couple of videos talking about the leading candidates for dark matter. And we're going to start with one that's very popular within particle physics, but probably less well known elsewhere, axions. Dark matter is invisible matter that we think must exist in huge amounts in the universe, but we don't really have any idea what it is. There is loads of evidence that leads us to believe in the magical dark matter. Link to my videos about all the evidence in the description. Check it out. But we have yet to detect any form of dark matter. That's not for lack of trying though. We predict there should be about five times more dark matter than regular matter in the universe. And we've been continuously looking for dark matter since the 1970s. If it's out there, we should find it sooner or later, right? In order for dark matter to solve the problems that we invented it to do, I mean, postulated it to do, a dark matter particle needs to have mass so that it interacts with other matter gravitationally, but it mustn't interact very much at all via the other fundamental forces. Otherwise, we'd have seen it by now. Now, let's talk about the axion, a popular dark matter candidate that has a lot of interesting properties and is a pretty believable suggestion but one I think isn't so well known or understood outside of academia. The axion is a hypothetical elementary field, and hence particle, that might solve a few problems in cosmology and particle physics. I should just say here that fields are used a lot in physics, and they're just basically things that pervade all of space. For example, temperature is a field, and every point in space has a value or temperature. A slightly less everyday, but more relevant example is the electron. The electron field exists everywhere in space, giving everywhere a certain amount of electronness. Excitations in a field then correspond to particles, so exciting the electron field gives you an electron. Similarly, if the axion field exists, then every point in space has a certain amount of axionness, and excitations in the axion fields give the axion particle, which might be our dark matter particle. So why can we propose this new field to exist, and why do we think it really does exist? It was first proposed in 1977 by Helen Quinn and Roberto Pecci, and it was proposed as a solution to something called the strong CP problem, and later it was realised that if it existed, it could also explain dark matter. Let's now talk about that strong CP problem, so we can understand where the axion really comes from. The strong CP problem refers to an apparent discrepancy between theory and observations, in an area of particle physics called quantum chromodynamics, or QCD. This area is all about one of the four fundamental forces, called the strong nuclear force, and this is the force that holds quarks together in the nuclei of atoms. The name might sound a bit strange if you haven't heard it before, quantum chromodynamics, and it comes from the fact that the gluon, which is the force carrying particle that transmit the strong force. It's like the photon, except it carries the strong force rather than the electromagnetic force. And this gluon has a property called colour charge. This means that gluons can either have a green colour charge, a blue colour charge, or a red colour charge. And this is some quantum property that helps us tell different gluons apart. It doesn't actually mean that gluons are certain colours, it's just a quirky naming convention that has stuck. And hence the study of this force is called quantum chromodynamics. In fact, gluons can even change colour charge many times a second, so don't take this naming convention too seriously at all. Anyway. In QCD, there's some problem called the strong charge parity problem, or strong CP problem. A system in particle physics is said to be invariant under parity if you can look at it in the mirror and it looks the same. For example, if I throw this ball up, I know it's going to drop down again. The equations of gravity tell me it will. If I do this same thing in a mirror world where left and right are flipped, the ball behaves in exactly the same way. If I throw it up, it comes down again. This is because the gravitational equations are invariant under parity. Flipping left and right makes no difference at all. The same should be true in most quantum particle systems too. Flipping left and right shouldn't make a difference to the equations, and hence it shouldn't change the physics. Similarly, a system is charge invariant if you can flip all of the electric charges in the system, so positive to negative and negative to positive and the physics stays the same there too. This is true in a simple electronic circuit. If you flip all of the charges from positive to negative and negative to positive, it all still works the same. A physical system is then charge parity invariant, or CP invariant, if you can make both of these changes and the equations and physics still stays the same. In these systems, you can look in a mirror and flip left and right around, and you can also flip all of the electric charges, and nothing in the physics actually changes. This is where things get interesting for QCD. You see, the equations that describe QCD actually say that if you do one of these CP transformations, 
that things don't have to stay the same. The theory of QCD allows for CP violation, and we should see interesting physics happening as a result. The QCD equations aren't necessarily invariant under charge and parity inversion. For example, if there is CP violation in QCD, then the neutron should have an electric dipole, but so far no electric field has ever been observed for a neutron which is literally named for the fact that it's electrically neutral. Either the dipole doesn't exist, and this is a piece of evidence that tells us that QCD doesn't violate charge parity symmetry, or the electric dipole does exist, but it's at least 109 times weaker than our theory suggests. So something else is wrong anyway. Either way, we need an explanation. Assuming the electric dipole of the neutron doesn't exist, then we have a theory that predicts CP violation, but we have no observational evidence that confirms this. So we need to expand our theory to tell us why we don't see it. I won't go into detailed equations of QCD here, but I will show you a simplified version of the Lagrangian of QCD to explain where axions come into all this as a proposed solution to the strong CP problem. The Lagrangian is a quantity that tells you about the state of a physical system, and it's usually denoted by this fancy L here. I'll put a subscript QCD here to remind us that this one is the entire Lagrangian for the strong force. We can then write the equation that gives us the Lagrangian in the following way, which ignores almost all of the complicated maths and gives us just the details we need to understand where the axion comes from. We can say that LQCD is equal to L invariant plus theta times L violated, where L invariant represents all the contributions to the equation that are invariant under CP transformations, and L violated denotes all the contributions that are not CP symmetric. This term that violates CP symmetry is multiplied by a physical parameter called theta, which at this point is just a number that has some value that we need to determine. If theta is equal to zero, then the strong CP problem just goes away, because the part of the equation that violated CP symmetry now doesn't contribute at all. So we would have a theory that's CP invariant, and this matches our observations. Note that if any of the quarks in the standard model of particle physics were massless, then theta would be forced to be zero in this theory but we don't observe any quarks to be massless in reality, so the only way to get theta to be zero is to just say, theta is zero because I say so. This is called fine tuning because there's no good or physical reason why theta should be zero. And so ascribing it a value of zero is a bit sus. Fine tuning is something most good physicists like to avoid. So if theta is zero, there should be a reason for it. This is where Petchy and Quinn come in with their idea to solve the strong CP problem in a more natural way. They suggested that we shouldn't assume that theta is a constant value at all, but rather we should promote it to a new dynamical field. So everywhere in space has some theta value, and this can vary from place to place. This has the added benefit of the fact that excitations in this new axion field would give us an axion particle. And this particle is our dark matter candidate. The particle would need to have no electric charge, no quantum spin, and actually a very small mass, somewhere around 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the electron which is already very light. The axion particle would also interact very weakly, or not at all, through the strong and weak nuclear forces, not at all through the electromagnetic force, and therefore only really interacts gravitationally, exactly as we need for a dark matter candidate. It's also likely that axion particles could have been produced in very large numbers in the early universe, giving us enough of them to account for all of dark matter today. But whoa, before we get carried away, how does changing the theta thing from a number to a dynamical field even solve the strong CP problem? Well, quantum fields like to minimize their energy, which basically means that over time, theta will decrease as much as it can. And by today, it should be very, very small, if not exactly zero. So the axion sounds like it solves the strong CP problem, and it provides a viable dark matter candidate. If you think this seems to clean up a few problems in cosmology, then you are not alone. The proposers of it actually named the axion after a cleaning product exactly for this reason. The downside to axions is that we've been looking for them for a really long time and we've never detected one. For example, the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, or CAST, has been searching for X-rays that should be produced when axions pass through strong magnetic fields. Nothing has been seen so far, so either the axion is even lighter and weakly interacting than we thought, or it's telling us we should be looking elsewhere for our dark matter. Whichever one it is, I guess only time will tell. But what do you think? Are you convinced that axions could be dark matter, or do you have a different preferred candidate? Maybe you don't think dark matter is a particle at all, and we simply need to modify our equations of gravity on some scales instead. Whichever it is, let me know in the comments below. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!
For example, if I throw this ball up, I throw this ball up, I know it will come down. I know it will come down. I know it's going to drop down. I know it's going to drop. I know it's going to drop down again.